Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch is Five Easy Ways to Engage Patients Using Your EHR Patient Portal. We're joined today by Justin Neese of Engage Patient. Justin is an expert in patient engagement whose experience extends to portal apps, patient wellness, and HIE. You can learn more about his expertise and credentials on your screen. As you read, I'll go through some quick housekeeping notes. Remember that you can ask questions of our presenter at any time during today's session by entering them into the chat area. In the second half of our session, we will address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, Answers to all submitted questions will be posted to our website and sent by email link later in the week. Also, remember that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the slides and the recorded version of this event. So if you're looking to get slides or share what you've learned with other folks, rest assured that we'll send out a follow-up email letting you do that. And sometimes people say, well, I didn't get the email. Remember to check your junk mail. Sometimes some systems will screen out that email. Well, Justin, first of all, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you, Brian. I look forward to our discussion. Great. So there's so much interest in uh, patient engagement and patient portals now with Meaningful Use Stage 2 coming. How would you define a patient portal, and what can you tell us about the different solutions that are available today? Yeah, great question. There's a lot of confusion, I think, uh, in the market around uh, patient portal, uh, practice portal, et cetera. Um, the, the simple answer um, to your first question is that um, a patient portal is typically an online application, um, obviously internet capable. Um, it is typically set up either through a website that already exists today or it can be a standalone uh, portal application website that, that has been built. Um, the, the typical patient portal functionality allows patients to interact through the portal um, through various functionality from uh, requesting appointments um, to uh, registration, etc. Um, I think that as we we go through the questions later today, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into more functionality, but that's the simple answer for what is a patient portal. Okay, and, and what are sort of some of the features then that people should expect from it? The, the, the most widely used pieces of that is um, the appointment request functionality where patients want to set up an appointment um, with their physician, provider, uh, et cetera. Um, the second most widely used functionality is a pre-registration uh, form that could be filled out, uh, downloaded, um, filled out, and then brought into the practice or filled out online through the portal. Those are the two most widely used pieces of functionality on a portal. All right. So there's different perspectives on this. What does patient engagement mean for the ONC and HHS? And then there's the practices. And uh, you mentioned a little bit about what the patients might expect from a portal. Tell us more about that. Yes, good, very good question. Um, ONC, um, HHS, um, through, um, as we all know, um, uh, the, uh, the recent uh, regulations that now flow through meaningful use in particular, um, they define that uh, now through meaningful use stage two is in the format that patients must be able to receive uh, what is called a clinical summary. Uh, it's basically a summary of their uh, encounter with the provider um, the day that they visit the provider and that uh, form of discussion must be uh, downloaded into a clinical summary and shared with the patient and also 
uh, through um, an online capability and also given the, the patient access to respond to that clinical summary. Um, there's a lot of mechanics behind that, but that is how ONC is defining it um, today. On the practice perspective, what, what we see that practices really want from a patient engagement experience is trying to prepare patients before they come into the office, uh, which can obviously improve the patient's experience. Uh, we've all sat in the waiting room filling out paperwork on clipboards. Um, we're, uh, I think the practicers are trying very uh, hard now to reduce that administrative burden. Uh, the other piece of this that's very important from a practice perspective is reducing what's called no-shows for appointments. Um, the industry average on no-shows is around 18 to 20 percent. Uh, this has a major effect on practices and their uh, ability to uh, see patients uh, effectively. And I think on the patient side, um, to the last part of your question, um, we as patients are also, I'll use the word consumers, and because we have such great access to technology for every other piece of our life today, we also want that retail experience in a healthcare format. Uh, we want to be able to view our information and understand what that information means uh, anytime through typically um, a mobile device uh, that we already use. I think that's a great point. I think that expectation is just growing from people as they have good consumer experiences outside of healthcare. There's really just going to be that demand that healthcare kind of catch up and offer that same sort of experience. Exactly. Now you, you talked about this a little bit, but let's dive a little deeper here on what are the features okay. that, that patients value you know, based on your experience and research, what are the ones that they really are looking for more than anything? You mentioned the appointment and and uh, did you mention the prescription renewal? Just no, let's go I, ahead and go not. through it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, we we have um, found this to be true in our experience, and as you mentioned, through uh, there's a lot of research out there. But what patients really want, first and foremost, is um, when we, when we talk about appointment scheduling, it's, it's not so much about requesting the appointment, but they want to know exactly um, the confirmation of that appointment as well. And um, scheduling is a very important piece of our busy lives today. So the ability to be able to request an appointment and confirm it uh, again through an online device, whether it's at home through our computer, uh, through our smartphone or tablet, most of the time appointment requests are being done after hours. Um, it's not typically during the day. So if we don't have that portal access, we don't have um, the ability to do that through online capabilities, um, it, it does have a negative effect on patient flow uh, for those uh, for those practices. Um, the other pieces on here that that you spoke of, Brian, the prescription renewal piece is obviously a very big um, want by patients today. Um, having, for example, the, your own personal health record that has been developed um, that you can access again through a mobile device. Within that uh, PHR, your personal health record, you have a list of all of your current medications and having the ability to um, request a renewal or um, another prescription is, is a big um, necessity by, by patients today. Um, I think these other ones all make sense. Um, you know, there's a growing need where patients want to be able to ask questions um, through, uh, again, a secure online messaging capability. Um, 
we all know that that we we see lots of texting today um, and email as well. So secure messaging is some is another convenient way for patients to be able to talk with their care team. Um, it's all going mobile as we have on the slide. Um, mobile access is, is going to be um, very critical in healthcare as we move forward. Uh, I don't think I need to spend a whole lot of time on that one. I think we probably all agree with that. Um, so that, that's very important. And then the last one on here that we're seeing a lot of movement on is um, we all get the EOBs in the mail, we get patient billing statements in the mail, and we all are trying to figure out what is that. Um, and furthermore, uh, we're finding that patients in the market are getting turned off by, uh, again, receiving snail mail. And being able to provide a clear view of the billing statement and allowing the patient to make a payment online is becoming a stronger want by patients in the market today as well. Absolutely, you know, and I think a lot of people have moved to largely paying their bills online. So it's another area where there's a consumer expectation that they should be able to do that with healthcare as well. Exactly. I mean, it's back to your point you made earlier, Brian, that you know we we have so many um, um, you know uh, technological um, transactions that we can make today. Um, when you think about being able to take a picture of a check uh, and make an electronic deposit without having to go to the bank, these are the types of things that that have to transition over into the healthcare sector as well. You know, and the on the secure messaging front, I think this has got to be something that's appealing to um, practices as well. And I think it's one of those things that is kind of a not maybe not widely recognized benefit that's going to come from meaningful use stage two. Um, because I, I, from our conversations, there's so many practices out there that really have some HIPAA concerns around how they're communicating with patients. And having yes. this secure messaging through a portal is going to make a big difference for them. It is. I mean, first and foremost, you hit it on the head. Obviously, we have um, to, to communicate in a uh, superior, secure environment, uh, HIPAA compliant um, is very important. Uh, but to, to the benefit of what you just spoke on is that practices want to reduce phone calls. And having the ability to answer messages through a secure online capability um, is very intriguing. So we've touched on meaningful use uh, stage two. Can you talk more about how that's going to impact uh, portals and patient engagement? Yes. Um, you know, th this is uh, the fun part of my job. Um, that's a joke. Um, but uh, <laughs> meaningful use stage two can be extremely confusing. Um, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners today um, are probably laughing over that because um, there, there are a lot of uh, uh, very specific um, understandings that we all have to have uh, regardless of whether you sit on the provider side or um, you're um, a technology that wants to operate within healthcare. Specific to patient portals and patient engagement, um, there are now some mandatory regulations and measurements that um, EHR uh, companies and even providers, when they want to go through attestation to receive uh, a bonus check um, for MU2 in the year of 2014, there are very specific criteria around that now. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is what we just um, previously discussed, which is around provider to patient communication. Um, there, there are now very specific standards and criteria that um, has to be fulfilled for ME2 
around secure messaging, and then that clinical summary that I spoke to earlier, um, all EHRs have to produce a clinical summary after the patient visit, and it has to be given to the patient within a very specific amount of time, and it has to be provided to them through um, an electronic format. Um, so, so that's one big um, criteria for MU2. The second one is provider-to-provider -provider communications. And this is really all around uh, what I highlight here, transitions of care. This is where a patient may be seeing the primary care physician, and that primary care physician now wants to refer the patient to, let's say, an orthopedic doctor. Um, in that transition of care, there are specific uh, components and measurements that have to be fulfilled as we transition that patient to the referring physician along with their health records. So that's another um, important um, criteria of MU2 around patient portal and patient engagement. And then the last one that's on here is is it you would think it would it would be somewhat um, elementary, but it's it's uh, it's actually a little bit more difficult than maybe some of our listeners um, realize. But now that we fulfill the provider to patient communication and the provider to provider communication, we now have to um, calculate the numerator and the the denominator appropriately and then put that into a reporting format that proves that we're hitting those metrics in that criteria. So those are the three um, what I would call um, primary components of meaningful use stage two that um, go in conjunction with portals and patient engagement. Well, and I think those are some of the elements of it that make people a little bit nervous about stage two. We're definitely hearing an uptick of anxiety about, from the practice side, about how to meet all of these standards. So I think those are ones that people have a lot of questions about, and I'm sure many uh, guests of this presentation have some of those questions. I'd encourage our guests to go ahead and ask questions. We'll get to those questions in the second half. We already have some, but uh, please go ahead and ask any questions you may have about uh, the subject matter today, and we'll get to them in the second half of our session. So this is a great question. What are cross what cross system integration is necessary to meet the usage requirements? Here we're getting into kind of the complexity of it. Yeah, it, it yes, it's a it's a it's a again a very uh, a very good question, Brian. Um, I in, I think to start with um, as we look at the first bullet on the slide, um, we, we need to touch on the importance of the patient experience. And um, I think we'd all agree that the patient experience becomes richer um, for all of us if we can break the code on integration, which is the question that you've asked. And what we find today um, in health systems, uh, even in the ambulatory space, um, is that everyone has some type of a portal, but from a patient experience, asking the patient to set up an account for each one of those portals does not drive uh, superior user adoption. And furthermore, what, what then ends up is for the provider and, and also the actual um, technology companies in, in healthcare, they're going to fall short of meeting the metrics and the standards that, that are out there. So, so that's kind of the first piece of that. But it, the integration discussion is really around um, we, we have to bring the EHR and the patient engagement platform together. Um, there are EHRs that have some type of an existing portal today, but now we're really moving from just talking about an online gateway for patients to 
uh, do some of the, the things that we talked about earlier to now we're talking about patient engagement. And what now that's going to drive is the ability for patients to do the things that we have talked about from requesting appointments online and actually getting confirmation to having a secure conversation with um, the care team that's with, within the health system. Um, we can't do that without integrating the clinical technology side with um, the patient engagement tools and the patient engagement platform. So that's very important um, in this next step. Now here's, uh, here's one on the horizon that uh, most people probably don't even want to think about yet, but Meaningful Use Stage 3 is supposed to come in 2016. What role is patient engagement going to play in that? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I was uh, at um, an event um, yesterday um, in Atlanta, Georgia, the, uh, the Health Information Technology Leadership Summit. And regardless of what was um, on the docket from uh, all of the speakers there, um, the word patient engagement was used about every five minutes. Um, and my point with that is that as healthcare moves to a value-based care system, um, patient engagement is the utopia of making it successful. Um, we will not be able to drive costs down and drive quality care, um, as I say here, significant uh, improvement in health outcomes for all of us, including myself, without patient engagement. So what what we can only say right now, and, and obviously this is why I say, you know, it's, it's my prediction, is that ME3 will only increase um, in patient engagement requirements. There will be more criteria around that. There will be more measurement around that, obviously. And the other thing I think um, that we should all think through carefully is not trying to um, get extremely sophisticated. I know there's a lot of discussion around big data in healthcare now, but there are a lot of ways through patient engagement that we can deliver cost-effective preventative uh, engagement uh, care plans. Um, so that's where we see it going, Brian, in the future. It's definitely um, going to be a, an extreme push uh, as we move forward. So your point about big data is that, in, if I'm understanding you right, is that in many ways uh, there's fruit hanging a lot lower than big data uh, in terms of patient engagement, that just really engaging with patient on preventative care and that sort of thing is is something that we're not doing well at all now, and that uh, that you see that as being an important part of uh, meaningful use stage three. Is that a fair interpretation? That's a fair interpretation. I'll share one stat with you that 50 percent of last year's high cost claimants spent less than five thousand dollars in the previous year. So the the point you just made. Um, this is a very specific measurement um, statistic that's out there. In other words, we, we don't see care catastrophes prior to them happening, and it's because of this cost-effective preventative engagement. There, there are things that we can do that are very simple um, that, that we already have the data on, uh, again, that can help us uh, improve outcomes for all patients. So a lot of people are trying to get ready for getting their patient portals going. What can a practice do to prepare? Yeah, I, I think we all know um, <laughs> one of the first uh, big steps is, is, is communication. Um, we, you know, we, we all have a variety of, um, uh, of experiences with 
a lot of different patients in the market. But um, again, we come back to the whole mobile discussion. Um, lots of folks are using smartphones today. Um, we, you, we have to encourage patients to utilize um, their existing devices um, in preparation for um, their discussion around, hey, we're getting ready to launch our own portal that you will have access to. Um, one of the things that, that we've done is developed a brief card for um, some of our channel partners that just speak to the what on the first side and the why on the back side. Um, it's a simple business card with a couple of points. Those are, um, you know, a couple of things to do. And then the other thing is, is as we put on here, it's very important to go ahead and start gathering um, cell phone information, which a lot of practices are doing. I think where we're still a little bit behind on is in getting the patient's email address as well. And so that, those are two important pieces of information that can be collected now. Um, and the last thing that we put on here is, um, is a web presence through Facebook. You know, we've got one billion um, folks uh, in the world that have a Facebook account and um, there uh, is a very high percentage within the practice that one employee has a Facebook account. Um, Facebook can be leveraged from a marketing perspective to also um, um, communicate with your patients through a social media platform as well. So what about patient demographics? How is that going to play into the patient portal? Yeah, I, as we said on here, you know, don't assume that only 20-somethings uh, are expecting uh, mobile access. Um, it, it, it's very important that um, we try to continue to be flexible and give a broader um, um, point of access for patients so that we can um, communicate and collect information uh, that's very important to then um, providing a, a great customer and patient satisfaction that is now proving to be very important in loyalty and retention um, in, inside you know the practices in the hospital environments. Yeah, I think this is a great point because there's this cliche that, you know, only young people are messing around on tablets, and that's certainly not the case. Um, and also there's kind of some complacency about it, I guess I would say, which is the notion that, you know, there's this huge generation gap in usage of this sort of technology. And obviously there's some, there may be some, you know, difference in, ha in how widely it's adopted, but to me it's basically just a, a faulty assumption that only young 20-somethings are going to want to have access to this kind of information because the same sort of consumer, uh, you know, expectations that we're talking about previously, those apply across demographics. I mean, people of all ages use Amazon, and they're going to have similar expectations for healthcare. I think. So I, I really think this is a great point. Uh, totally agree. Totally agree. So what's, what's some advice you can give folks for actually launching their patient portal? Well, yes, the first step is, um, is, is getting complete buy-in from the entire care team. Um, I think that um, with that first bullet is that we see that um, the adoption inside um, uh, a practice or a health system environment is, is not um, very uh, complex in the fact that we find that the administrators and the providers inside are, are really looking for more efficiency and a, and a more effective way to communicate. So um, it, it's important that you share uh, the, the, um, the rollout um, the mechanics of what you're going to offer uh, from the functionality 
and um, we find that this can be done very quickly um, with your staff and, and folks inside uh, the practices. Um, it, it's, it's also important that, um, you know, as we put on here, there, there are some folks that are rewarding early adopters um, who, um, you know, uh, there's lots of different ways that you can do this with patients as well. Um, in giving out coupons and um, um, some, some uh, of your vendors and suppliers will offer to help um, in, in the promotion of that. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be done there uh, from a patient adoption perspective too. Um, I think the, the, the tougher piece of this is, is around making sure that the workflow within the operation is clear to all the folks who have very specific you know, job responsibilities. As we talked about here, inbound calls, outbound calls, um, billing statements, you know, each one of the components that supply information or a piece of information through the workflow of those facilities and the health system, these are the things that, that tend to get lost sometimes. And so it's very important that um, before you launch, you walk through, okay, this is how inbound calls will now work. Um, and we'll, we'll utilize secure messaging. Here's how we'll respond. Here's who will respond. Here's how fast we'll try to respond, et cetera. So, that, that's where the majority of the work is, is really talking through the workflow pieces and making sure everyone understands, um, quote, the new methodology. When it comes to rewarding uh, patients who do engage through a patient portal, it seems to me to make sense to do that in the sense that it's also really good for the practice. I mean, this is ultimately going to be more efficient communication for the practice, and, and there will be ancillary benefits too, but, you know, as you were saying before, like, practices don't want to spend all their day answering phone calls. This is a much more efficient way to do business. So that gives you room, I would think, to incentivize patients to use these communication technologies. Yes, and patients, um, patients are, are, as you said, they, they really want um, the access, the 24-7 access, that virtual uh, capability, right, at, uh, on their time frame uh, when they need it. Sure, and we were talking about, uh, you know, the generation gap and how it's kind of oversold, but there is one aspect of it that may be true, which is that younger people tend not to even want to talk on the phone. They want to email, they want to text, you know, they, they, they don't want to call and talk to someone at the front desk. They want to just be able to log in and take care of what they need to take care of. And I think that will also be a growing expectation. So that's it's interesting how that may play out. So uh, we touched on the ONC before, but beyond the sign-ups and meeting those thresholds, what is the key to meeting those ONC requirements and, and actually keeping the patients interested in using this technology? Yes, um, to your point, ONC, the, the actual ONC requirements or meaningful use requirements are um, specific to, you know, three, four um, um, pieces of criteria within uh, the actual certification process, but, but it's, it's much bigger than that, right? When we talk about patient engagement, um, what, what we try to do and what we've learned is that um, you can fulfill or check the box on the ONC requirements, but the question really is, is that really enough, which is what you're asking here to keep patients, um, quote, engaged? Um, and the answer is no. Um, you know, patients want, um, um, they, they want to be able to, to access, um, you know, the richness of all of these features through a mobile application. And, um, you know, while we think that it would be great to think that, that this is possible today in healthcare, um, there, we're still well behind in providing a mobile app for patients 
to be able to do all these and, and more importantly to be able to do these uh, seamlessly with a great integration solution with the actual practice management system and the actual EHR uh, operating system that the practice is already using. Um, the last thing the patient wants is to come back in after they've pre-registered, let's say through the portal, and when they get to the, the actual office and they're handed a clipboard to, to uh, fill out more information. Um, <laughs> that, that really defeats the purpose of, of utilizing and leveraging a patient portal to collect um, the pre-registration information um, ahead of time, right? Because none of us want to sit in the waiting room uh, an extended amount of time and none of us want to continue to fill out information. So it's important that we, we all work on um, that customized registration um, and deliver it back to the practice management system in EHR um, in an integrated approach so that the patients only have to fill out registration once uh, for um, an established uh, provider relationship. The other thing that I think is very important on here is that um, we need to find out what is of interest to the patients. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of simple ways to do that, but, but what we find specifically through um, a very uh, precise, concise patient satisfaction survey. Um, those, again, need to be delivered electronically so it allows the patient um, as they're, um, um, you know, in their daily life be able to fill those out um, really less than five minutes, um, so five, six, seven key questions. And collecting that information and doing something with that, that, that means a lot to patients. Hey, wow, you know, they're really trying to understand what's important to me, what worked, what didn't work. Um, providing that information back to the practice and then uh, utilizing it to make adjustments in um, whether it's operational workflow or whether it's in um, your actual check-in process, et cetera. These are key things that we see are, are keeping patients engaged. Well, and to your point about filling out the same paperwork over and over again, that's got to be just one of the perennial frustrations of dealing with the healthcare system that it, you know, it seems like every time you go in, you have to fill out the same form or a different form that gets the same information. Sometimes if you're in a hospital and you just go to a different part of the hospital, you have to fill out paperwork all over again. This drives people crazy, and it's completely unnecessary uh, with the proper technology. So I think that would be of great benefit to patients. I mean, they would love it if they could just fill out the form one time electronically and be done with it. That alone would be, I think, very valued by patients. Exactly. Well, we've saved plenty of time for questions and answers, and we already have some great questions from our audience. Uh, for folks who haven't asked their questions yet, please go ahead and do so. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. It's a rare opportunity to talk to an expert about patient engagement, and this is a subject that I think people have many questions about. So please let those questions uh, type them into your chat area. And if we do run out of time, uh, we'll follow up with written answers to the questions you ask. One other thing I'll mention is that Every once in a while, people ask very technical questions. We want to give our expert, Justin, the opportunity to defer an answer to especially thorny questions, if, if necessary, to the written answers. Sometimes people want references to particular codes or that sort of thing, which we can follow up with. So let's dive a little deeper here on secure messaging. The question from the audience is, are there any suggested guidelines on how to manage secure messaging? My understanding is that secure messaging is a requirement of stage two. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, it is. So any um, portal is going to include a secure messaging component or it can't be certified? Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Well, what other advice could you give uh, practices for and providers around secure messaging? Yeah, so 
Um, it's a great question, and um, if, if I'm following um, the listener's uh, question, what, what we typically see um, out in the market today is where some providers aren't ready to, quote, turn it on. Even though they've adopted um, uh, a patient engagement strategy, they're very concerned about, wow, how am I going to keep up um, if, if I get all of these inbound, quote, messages and or um, emails? So, so I'll give one answer to that today. There's obviously a lot of answers, but, but one thing to keep in mind that, that um, I think can help with the actual uh, flow of questions and then obviously the answers that go back. Um, secure messaging doesn't have to be all free-form text. Um, so don't think of it as, um, as simple as we're just giving them a box to write an email and now we've got to read every word and then try to decipher what they really meant <laughs> and then produce an answer. Um, try to funnel that down into very specific uh, options of, of subjects. You know, is this related to a recent an appointment that you've made? Do you want to reschedule? Um, are you, um, it, is it specific to a medication that has been prescribed? If so, which, which medicine? Um, I use those as examples because those are typical, th those are typically the top two categories. It's typically around uh, meds or around appointments, and probably the third one would be around uh, lab results. So if there's a way that you could build um, your, your questions or, or the actual subjects so that the patient then can check each one of those appropriate fields, um, then when it gets funneled into the practice or the health system, now you know specifically what areas that are of interest to the patient. Those may get funneled to different folks as well, and then those answers can be quick, much faster produced and not so much free-form text. I think that's what worries everybody is that it's a free-form text email. And while that is part of it, and it can be part of it, it doesn't necessarily just have to be uh, free-form text. All right, let's ask another question from our audience. What should people do if their EHR company doesn't have a good patient engagement solution? Well, um, being very biased, I would say you need to talk to us. <laughs> um, but um, it, it, it is not something uncommon. Um, what? Um, so what, I, I have to imagine. I sorry to interrupt, but I have to imagine that as EHRs are kind of scrambling to meet these stage two requirements, they it must just be all over the map in terms of some probably just have minimal patient portals that barely meet the requirements, and others probably have pretty good ones. Um, so there's got to be just all sorts of different uh, you know technologies out there. There are, um, I, to your point, Brian, it's all over the board. Um, what we, we see, um, which is why we do what we do, which um, is not trying to be an EHR, um, we are partnering with a lot of EHRs to deliver the, the question that was asked by um, the, the, the listener. And um, we do that in multiple ways to give um, that practice or that health system the capabilities and the ability to integrate with their existing EHR. So there are folks like us that are out there that just focus in patient engagement. Um, and, um, uh, and quite frankly, there are a lot of EHRs who are very much more focused on the clinical capabilities of Meaningful Use Stage 2 and um, not so much around uh, the portal and patient engagement piece. 
and they utilize someone like us to bring those capabilities to the party. Well, and uh, for people who are interested, we're going to share this URL with you again in a moment, but uh, you can visit EngagePatient.com uh, to learn more about that uh, product that Justin's talking about. But it, it just makes sense to me that, you know, a company that's actually focused um, exclusively on those tools is going to develop a fuller capability and a better patient experience than an EHR. For, for them, it's kind of an afterthought for many of them, I'm sure. So that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're looking to do more than just meet the MU requirements. If you're really trying to take that to the next level, it just makes sense to me that you would have a better product. Yes, and, that, and that's what we find, Brian, in the market is that, um, you know, for MU1, there were some very, very basic pieces, and everybody just decided to, uh, to your point, you know, we sometimes say in the industry, check the box and build that one or two um, pieces of code to check the box, but now with MU2 and then further with MU3, um, EHRs are now saying, you know, this isn't something that, that we really want to focus in. Sure, and you know, there's really, after all the expansion of EHR products after MU1, now we are starting to see that winnowing that I think a lot of people have expected is some of these companies, frankly, are just finding it too difficult to meet the standards. Yes. Well, let's go to another question from our audience. Okay. Do patient portals have to be certified to include their reports in Meaningful Use Stage 2? Um, I, I, I wish I could ask a, a clarifying question on that. Um, well, go ahead and ask, and maybe our guests will uh, follow up as well. What would okay, be the follow-up you would ask? Yeah, the, the question I think what they're alluding to is we're, we're talking about, and, and this is the word or words that uh, MU2 and ONC uses, which is the clinical summary. And I think what they are asking is can they post a clinical summary to the portal if it is not certified? And that question, the answer to that would be no, they cannot do that. It has to be integrated with the EHR and it has to be certified under um, the EHR requirements. And then to take it one more step, when their providers decide to uh, get in line to go through attestation, to get a bonus check, they're going to have to prove that 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 the, those steps are also met, that they're using a certified tool, and that it is uh, fully integrated. All right. Well, we'll see if there's follow up. If but I think that uh, yeah. Okay. Oh. No, <laughs> no, actually, the guest just said thank you. That does answer the question. Great. All okay, right. Awesome. I think that's what they were saying. Okay. Great. All right. So let's ask another question from our audience then. Uh, this is a good one. It's kind of a detail here, but it's an important one. Does a patient requesting a medication refill via the patient portal, does that count toward that required 5% secure messaging threshold? No, it does not. Yeah, it's a great question, whoever asked that. Um, that is a separate, um, that's a separate criteria and a separate measurement. When we talk about the 5%, which they alluded to, the 5% is specific to, again, I'll go back to the clinical summary. So, so they have to prove, the provider and the EHR together have to prove that 50% of their patients are receiving the clinical summary through an online tool. So that's the 50%. But now we get to the 5%, which is the question they were asking. 5% of the patients have to do view, download, or transmit of the clinical summary. So the 5% that they alluded to in the question is specific to the patient either viewing the clinical summary downloading the clinical summary. And what that means is they could download it and save it 
to their uh, quote drop box within their PHR or the third part is that they are transmitting it to a, another person on their care team. So that's the 5% metric and that's what you have to prove. It's, it's, it's not inclusive of an e-prescription. All right, great answer on that. Um, great question. <laughs> So here's a question for people who are, you know, kind of in those critical access areas, you could call them. What do you suggest for a practice with 75% senior citizens in a rural area, and most of them don't even have internet in the home? Yeah, this is a great question, and um, uh, we, are, we are working with a couple of critical access center uh, hospitals and we have run into this, um, you know, being very transparent and very candid up front, there is no perfect answer for this, but, but let me suggest a couple of ideas. The first idea is around the, the fact that um, these, this particular demographic doesn't have an email address as well. Um, in our capabilities today, um, at the time of the encounter, we um, are able to create uh, an email address um, very quickly um, through some capabilities that we develop. And then the second piece of that is, is that we are able to allow the access and assign access to a caretaker. Um, what that then does is now allows for that particular demographic that we're speaking to um, the ability um, to, to share their information um, with a caretaker. My, my parents are elderly and I am um, um, caretaker for them and, they, and, and I have done this for them. The, the, the second thing, just real quick, Brian, I want to hit on too is that through our research and studies, which is, what's very interesting, and it goes back to our previous discussions, is that a very high percentage of this demographic, when they still come into these rural area or critical access center environments, they all still have a cell phone. It's a very staggering um, revelation for us um, and so, therefore, my point with that is that we, we tend to think that, okay, they don't have, you know, a computer, they don't have a tablet in this new technology form, but the majority of them do have a mobile device called a cell phone. Um, so there are still ways that, that if you connect with the right patient engagement platform and tool, um, we can still speak to those patients through the device that they currently have, which um, we're finding even in that older demographic, they do have cell phones. Hopefully that gives a couple of ideas. Uh, again, there's no silver bullet with the question, but um, um, Hopefully that can provide a little bit of color on that. Are there um, are there some exemptions available if you're in areas where there's not the threshold of internet usage? I I know that applies in some areas. I I can't remember if it applies to patient portals or not. No, not today. Um, all the measurements are still built uh, built around the criteria of quote. Uh, an online electronic access. So, um, yeah, in today's current ONC requirements, there, there's not. So here's another question about um, the capability for messaging. The portal, can the, should the portal be able to handle attachments like lab reports and that sort of thing? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. So that's one of those core capabilities. Is that required, or is that just something they should expect? Um, it's not technically required yet. Um, and, what, and back to this clinical summary, Brian, um, 
you know, if you were to get your lab result today, um, nothing against you, Brian, but the majority of consumers, you're not going to be able to decipher what it actually means on the piece of paper. And so where we've moved to now is, is a CCDA um, uh, for simple words, and, and actually they use these words, human readable format, mm -hmm. which converts to the clinical summary, which is, is an interpretation of the encounter that gives the patient hey, this is what the doctor told me, here were my vitals, these were the meds that were prescribed, he asked me to go get lab work, and this is what that entailed, et cetera. So we're converting all this information now into a clinical summary, and that's what has to be posted online. Now, patients want their lab results, patients want um, you know, radiolo uh, if, if you get anything from a radiology perspective as well, images. And so what great patient portals will be able to do is, is allow the patient to then accept those documents and save those documents into their own um, sort of health folder, health library, so that they can further access those and then utilize those as they get referred to other providers and physicians within their network so that they have one place, one repository that has all of their continuum of healthcare in that location. Yeah, and again, as we've talked throughout uh, our session today, I think those expectations are going to be there from the patients. They they certainly are not going to understand why they, you know, can't have access to that information when it's one of their main wants, I would think, in using a patient portal. It is. It is. It, it, it's a driving increase in uh, what the patient wants to have access to. You've got it. So if your patient portal doesn't have that capability, that's definitely something where you may want to look at other solutions. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time for questions. We didn't get to all the questions. We had a lot of great ones from the audience, but I want to remind our guests again that uh, we'll follow up with a written response to these questions. So if we didn't get to you on the air here, uh, just wait for those written responses, and uh, Justin will be happy to answer those questions for you. Um, I want to thank you, Justin, for joining us. This is a great session on a subject that there's a lot of interest in today, so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Formed Approved as well for um, allowing me to uh, talk to your um, to your audience and um, it was a great question, great session. Well, we want to encourage people to learn more about the tool offered by Justin and uh, Engage Patient. That's go to www.engagepatient.com. That's engage with an I in the beginning there, so make sure you spell it properly. But if you're looking for a portal solution they have a great product that you should learn more about, so do check out that website. I want to thank our guests for joining us today. Uh, remember that all registered attendees of this session will receive an email with links to both the slides and the video recording of this session, along with those written responses I talked about before. For comprehensive training and meaningful use, register for Format Approved Certified Meaningful Use Professional, or CMUP, course. The course covers the requirements for both Stage 1 and Stage 2 of Meaningful Use for both eligible professionals and eligible hospitals, along with clinical quality measures, HIPAA considerations, and more. Visit the URL on your screen. That's www.formatapproved.com slash education slash courses underscore cmup.html. Sorry for that mouthful. And uh, in the slides, you'll just be able to click on that link and visit the course, learn more about it, and register. There's certainly a lot to learn with Stage 2 on the horizon. Visit formatapproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning lunches. The learning lunch button there on the bottom of the screen will take you to our slate of upcoming webinars where you can learn more and register. Our next learning lunch will air on November 19th, and we'll cover the subject of what, what can you do to prevent a CMS audit. CMS is about to launch a new audit regime around the omnibus final rule, so I'm sure there's a lot of interest in that question as well. Keep an eye on your email box and our homepage for other upcoming topics, and thank you again for joining us today.